Greetings to you in the name of Jesus Christ. My name is Kerry Enright and I'm one of the ministers of Knox Church, Dunedin, New Zealand. And it's our delight to bring this short time of prayer and reading and reflection. People gather physically for worship at Knox Sunday by Sunday and we are pleased to be able to offer this to those who are unable to gather or who are unable to be with us. God be with you. Let's begin with a prayer. God, in the story of your people, we see and hear much we recognise. In the life of your Son, we see and hear many things that challenge our cherished ideas. In the passage of your Spirit, we see and hear many things which show that change is possible. God, constantly present in human story, we open ourselves to all that you would show us now, through word and prayer, help us, meet us where we are, and show us where we need to be, and then go with us as we move. In Christ we pray. Amen. On Sunday, in the gathered worship, we are going to be celebrating the sacrament of baptism. And so today, in the service, I want to reflect on baptism, infant and adult, and the dimensions of grace and of faith. Let's come to God with a prayer of praise and of confession. Let us pray. God, the source of all, we praise you that from its very beginning you have been part of creation, inextricably woven into its story, feeling its glory and its greyness. Jesus, the Shearer, we praise you that through your humble birth you became part of the human story, inextricably woven into its experiences, feeling its delights and its dilemmas. Spirit, the Shaper, we praise you that through all stories you have arced history towards justice, inextricably woven into its trajectory, feeling its freedoms and its frustrations. Triune God, source and sharer and shaper, we praise you, that though we may not understand you, you understand us and our stories and help us to enter into their potential. God, you, are, you intended the world to be a place of provision and plenty for all. We confess that sometimes in our attitudes or actions we have taken more than we need at the expense of others. God, you intended the world to be a place of fairness and flourishing for all. We confess that sometimes in our attitudes and actions we have lived as though we alone mattered. God, you intended the world to be a place in which all play their part in the wholeness of creation. We confess that sometimes in our attitudes and actions we have avoided our responsibilities or prevented others from fulfilling theirs. Forgive us, and by your Spirit help us as we try to live differently in the week ahead. In Christ we pray. Amen. The life and words of Jesus assure us of the generous depths of God's forgiveness and of its restorative power. Through the energy of the Spirit, may God help us now to love and live differently, that we and this world might be all that God intended it to be. In Christ we pray. Amen. Itifano, in Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Now I want to read uh, two passages from the Bible, first from Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, chapter 12, and verses 1 to 13. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, 
any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And a reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 23 to 32. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I will go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of the father? They said the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. Thanks be to God for these readings from the Bible. And may God grant us understanding of them and enable the word of God to enter into our hearts. Amen. And now a reflection. Well, as I indicated earlier, in our gathered worship at Knox, we are going to be celebrating the sacrament of baptism.
And it wasn't so long ago in our congregation that we baptised an adult. This Sunday it'll be a child, but not so long ago it was an adult we baptise. Whether we baptise infants or adults, the same theology of baptism applies. And I believe it's helpful for us to practice both infant and adult baptism because they highlight different aspects of the faith. The same theology. Baptism marks the commencement of Christian life. In being plunged into the water and rising from it, we proclaim that the person is united with Christ in his dying and in his being raised. The person enters into the life of being cleansed from sin and of receiving the life-giving Spirit. The person is welcomed into God's new society of love. Baptism marks the start of a faith journey towards God's coming renewal of all things, the renewal of the whole of creation. Different aspects some churches baptise infants and some don't. The Roman Catholic and Orthodox traditions or strands, the two largest strands, certainly do. And many Protestant churches do. But Baptists and most independent and evangelical and Pentecostal churches don't. Indeed, there are some within our own Presbyterian tradition who oppose infant baptism. Unlike them, I want to hold both practices together and to note what each contributes. One of the important theologians of the last century, Karl Barth, opposed the practice of infant baptism for three reasons. First, he said that infant baptism didn't figure in the Bible and so has no biblical authority. And he may well be right. Although there is reference to households being baptised, it seems that the baptism of children started in the second century. But from early on it became widespread and became almost normal. Bart also argued that infant baptism has led to the disastrous assumption that people become Christian virtually by birth, that we are born Christians. Bart argued that this watered down the Christian faith and contributed to the Church's lack of vibrancy today. If we become Christian at birth, that suggests that there is nothing new about being Christian, whereas newness is our constant refrain. The Church is meant to be an alternative society of radical love, offering the world a different perspective and a different way of being. But remember that Karl Barth was writing at a time and in a context when national churches had been taken over by some shocking national values, very anti-Christian values. So in that context, it was no wonder that he thought that infant baptism had been subjected to abuse. But so, unfortunately, has every doctrine and practice of the Church, and yet we still hold to them. The third of Karl Barth's arguments is the most significant. Baptism has two sides to it. There is first the action of God, baptism with the Spirit, and then there is a corresponding human reaction, baptism with water. So, in baptism, we celebrate both the divine gift and a human response. We celebrate the gift of God's life with us, and we celebrate the beginning of a new life in Christ. Bart argues that infant baptism emphasizes the first, but neglects the second, namely how we as human beings enter into free and responsible Christian discipleship. Bart says, yes, the Christian faith is certainly about God's unmerited love. 
but it is also about making a free and glad human answer to that love. So let's talk about how we can hold these two things together. Central to, our, to baptism is our belief that we receive God's love and that we are claimed for God's service. Baptism declares that before we can ever respond, God is for us. Nothing we can do can earn God's love. It is a free gift, but it is not a free gift for simply receiving and filing away. Baptism is for living out, day by day, week by week, year by year. We are to live out the baptized life. We may be immersed at one time in water, in baptism, but we are to remember that moment every day of our lives with the constant flow of water over our lives. In other words, yes, we are baptized, but we're to live out our baptism. So the two practices of infant baptism and adult baptism belong together. Infant baptism conveys God's love for us before we can respond. It declares that God takes the initiative with us. It demonstrates that even when we are helpless, we are loved and affirmed by God. And it celebrates, this coming Sunday, for example, God's love of every child, of every person. It celebrates God's welcome of children into a faith community, into a faith community that takes responsibility for helping this child and all our children mature in faith. It celebrates the beginning of a process of growing into Christ. And that process cannot happen unless, as adult or child, we are part of a supportive community of faith. And at a certain point, our intent as a congregation is that the child we baptize stands before a congregation one day and accepts the gift of living life as a disciple of Jesus Christ. So that is of infant baptism. What of adult baptism? Well, adult baptism highlights the importance of responding to that love in our daily lives. We are called to explicit public confession of faith at all stages of our journey. But as there are risks with infant baptism, so there are risks with adult baptism. The risk of adult baptism is that it can seem that faith comes before God's love, that our commitment comes before God's love of us. And it also carries the risk of making faith individualistic, of making it about my faith, my relationship with God whereas Christianity is fundamentally a communal faith. A faith, yes, that we hold personally, but as part of a community of Jesus Christ. And we grow in faith as part of a community, as a member of the body of Christ. A body that stretches back millennia and will reach forward millennia. So two sides, two dimensions to be held together. Grace and faith. In infant baptism we celebrate the faith of the community of faith, including the faith of the parents. Baptism then is a sign of human solidarity, that at no stage in our life are we isolated or are we to be isolated from each other or from God. We celebrate the grace of God that draws us deeply into relationship and forms us together into a new community, an alternative community of radical love. So, in baptism, we celebrate our life in family and in community. 
And we also celebrate God's patient pursuit of every person. Now, I was baptised at the age of 18. But looking back, I have no doubt whatsoever that God had been pursuing me patiently for many years. And I am grateful for God's patience, that God never gave up on me until I was able to make my own public response in, in due time. Ever before we are conscious of it, faith is being planted in us. Because faith works at a deeper level than our consciousness, deeper than our intellectual capacity, deeper than our capacity to understand. Faith isn't limited to what happens in our minds. I remember many years ago visiting a congregation in Hungary where children who were intellectually disabled were being prepared for professing their faith in front of the congregation. They may well have appreciated the depths of faith in a way that I never will. The Holy Spirit is at work in our lives long before we recognize her. The Holy Spirit works in the lives of infants and children through parents and grandparents, through teachers and friends, through faithful congregations and many more ways. But we cannot take this for granted if it is if it's only God. For every baptism calls the congregation to care, to nurture and to guide the baptized child. Every baptism asks a congregation whether its life is enabling people to grow as disciples of Jesus. So it is that when we baptize, we are committing ourselves to include in our life babies and infants and children and young adults and older people and very old people. When we baptize, we are committing ourselves to being a multi-generational faith congregation and to point beyond the family circle and beyond the local church to God's love for the whole world. Well, I think it is marvellous that we, in our tradition and in our congregation, are able to celebrate both infant baptism and adult baptism. They have the same underlying theology, and they each remind us of dimensions of faith that need to be held together. God be with you, and God go with you. Let's spend a little moment in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the reminders every day of your love of us, of your patient pursuing of us, that you never let us go, we can get ourselves into all kinds of fixes and all kinds of situations. But you, you keep with us. You stay with us. You abide with us. And in doing so, you open up all kinds of possibilities for how we might live, how we might love, how we might hope, and how we might believe. We pray for people who feel stuck, stuck in a place they don't want to be, with a kind of being that they, they're unhappy about. We pray for them, that they may have a deep sense of you being with them, abiding with them, staying with them, and opening out possibilities that maybe they hadn't thought of. We thank you for all that you do in Jesus Christ, for the world you created and that you continue to love. In Jesus we pray. Amen. And something of a blessing. May the God, whose names are many, but whose nature is constant, the one whose story is complex, but whose purpose is clear, May that God enable us 
to deepen in love, develop in understanding, and be determined in action, that we and the world we inhabit can move ever nearer to that which God intends. Kia tau, kia tato kato, te adafai o tau tato riki o ihu koraiti. Me te aroha o te atua, me te whiwhinga tahi tanga ki te wairua tapu. Ake, ake. Amen. Go in peace. God goes with you.